hope that you had a wonderful festive winter break and uh, have a good rest. So Sysop is back this term with uh, our engaging weekly talks and even more exciting socials, which we hope you will enjoy in time to come. So um, today we have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Andrew Schaefer to speak with us today. Dr. Schaefer was previously a professor of neuroscience in the Department of Neuroscience, Biology and Pharmacology in UCL, first starting as a group leader here um, in the Francis Crick Institute. His work focuses on analyzing mechanisms of sensory processing with the mouse olfactory system as a model and aiming to develop uh, new techniques for electrophysical physiological recordings and high throughput behavioral approaches. Dr. Schaefer's talk will discuss how spatial temporal order cue structures can be represented in a mammalian brain and access behaviorally via probing representation and processing across brain areas. He will introduce how this can be achieved via correlative multimodal imaging approaches centered around synchrotron X-ray tomography techniques. Lastly, Dr. Schaefer will discuss how such methods can be used to image tissues with synaptic resolution to feasibly dissect neural circuit anatomy across different brain areas. Without further ado, let us now put our hands together for Dr. Schaefer. Thank you very much, Dr. Asad. The principal just gave my talk already, but it's much more compact than I'll be able to do. Um, it's a very interesting audience, very mixed audience, I think. Who of you is, has a study sort of studying biology or medicine, biochemistry, or these kind of things? Is anyone sort of more in physics, engineering, maths, computer science? Great. So I was just saying to, um, to the here two leaders here, um, Either there's something for everyone in the talk or everyone will be bored the entire time. So let's see, let's see where we end up. Feel free to interrupt me if you want. We can try to keep it as, uh, as interactive as, you're, as you want in the end, but happy to take questions any time. So I'm a uh, circuit neuroscientist. So I studied physics originally, you know, quantum field theory was my, my first degree. I forgot everything. I kept the arrogance that I should be able to understand everything. But uh, now for the last uh, 15 years or so, my lab is a, yeah, it's a neuroscience lab. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to do, trying to understand how the brain works. How, and with working, I mean how information is processed in the brain. How something comes in from the outside, some information is extracted, something's computed, ultimately resulting in maybe behavioral actions, behavioral decisions. So in a nutshell, if you look at this sketch of a human brain, you want to figure out you know, how is information going from one part of the brain to another one? What is this information? What happens in these little nodes that we would call you know, thinking or processing or information processing, and what are the algorithms that lie in there that allow us to actually, you know, do what you're hopefully doing now, thinking, paying attention, figuring out what I'm trying to say, or hopefully criticizing me along the line. And being a somewhat reductionist physicist, the way I think about the problem is, well, let's maybe focus onto one of those nodes, onto one of those brain regions. So what does it mean to understand computation in that brain region? Well, it's a little bit like trying to understand computation in maybe an electric, an electric circuit. So there's some information coming in, there's some information coming out, and there's some stuff happening in there, such that what comes in looks different from what comes out, or the other way around. So that there's some sort of added benefit, restricting, ignoring some information, um, creating something that makes it maybe more real to understand what the information is that comes in here. And I'm trying to, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, trying to talk you through that, through our approach, how do we think about to actually study what gets into the brain, and how we think about what gets out of the brain, out of that brain region down here, and our approach is to looking at these kind of circuits, and how neurons are connected with each other, and how they process information. We talk about sort of one specific brain region that I've spent, as someone who introduced me to it, has spent decades on trying to understand that brain region makes me feel even older than I think I am. Um, so what, what specifically are we studying? As uh, was said earlier, we, we predominantly use, a, as a model system, the olfactory system of mice. So if you want to study computation in the brain, you can pick very many different brains to work on. You can pick the human brain and try to study information on these sort of larger, larger scales, but it's very difficult to really drill down to what individual neurons, what these individual of these 100 billion or so neurons are doing. Or you can go to the other extreme and take a small, very compact organism, like maybe fruit flies or, or, or nematodes, and look at what these much smaller brains are doing. My choice for the last 20 years or so has been to work on a mammalian model system, on a mouse, but this being a model system that we can actually work with, that we can 
interfere with, we can train them to do something, we can ask questions, directly interrogate the brain. And maybe towards the very end, I'll tell you a little bit how we're thinking of translating some of those uh, approaches to, um, to the actual, um, actual human brains as well. So if you work with mice, mice, as many of you know, at least those of you who spend time on the London Tube will certainly know that mice are night active, they run around in the dark, so they spend a lot of, a lot of their energies in figuring out what's going around them, not so much by seeing, but actually, actually by smelling. So that's why I think the sense of smell, so maybe, you know, you could be interested in smells because you're interested in pheromones or perfumes or just the beauty of those millions of different, different molecules. Um, but you can also look at it as a very convenient model system to get an entry point into understanding how the brain of a mammal or the brain of a mouse works, because smelling is something, or the sense of smell is one of the key ones, uh, key ones for mice. So this is a cross section through the mouse brain, for, through the anterior, the front part of the mouse brain. So you could have to imagine it from coming from here. This is the very front bit, essentially the inside of the nasal cavity, the nasal epithelium, and each of those green dots is one specific uh, receptor neuron. So those have the job to convert the chemical information, volatile chemicals of smells, into electrical impulses. And then they send their axons, the part of, the part of them that sends information onwards to the rest of the brain, send these axons into this forebrain structure here, about a few cubic millimeter, millimeter large, around a million cells or so, so-called olfactory bubble. And what you already see in this picture is there's a neat organization, looks quite random, randomly scattered in the epithelium, but all those green receptor neurons actually send their axons to pretty much one spot. This, this green one here called the glomerulus. If we dig in a little bit more, how does this, uh, how does this structure the olfactory bulb look like? This is somewhat schematic, and you get more real pictures later on. Um, what you see is that information is coming in here, those green fibers, the ones coming from the nose. Information gets in here. There's also information flowing out of the olfactory bulb to various cortical areas. For those of you interested in these kind of things, this could include the amygdala or the adjoining cortex or various other, um, other cortical areas like piercing. But what matters for our discussion here, there's information coming in, there's information coming out, and actually there seems to be quite a direct link between it. Those fibers, those axons that come into the brain, they, they make contacts in these brown structures, these brown structures here, so-called glomeruli, already with those output neurons, with these peptid and microcells, as they're called. And then there's a large number, of, large number of local neurons that do some kind of computation. So you have a model here that looks not so different to my extremely reductionist picture here. You have an input layer, you have an output layer. These are actually quite intimately linked, but you have a lot of sort of computational substrate, a lot of computing power, if you wish, in this, uh, in this brain structure. So the goal of my lab is to use the olfactory bulb as a model system to understand what kind of computations the brain actually, uh, actually does. Now, the first question you have to ask is, well, if you want to probe what computation happens here, you need to ask the system or the animal an interesting question. You need to ask it a difficult question. If you, you know, you can answer simple questions by being largely asleep and using only a very tiny part of your brain. So equivalently, we don't want to ask the animal to, to do very, very simple tasks or present only very simplistic stimuli, because then we have no way of figuring out what these about 900,000 or so interneurons are actually doing. Um, and for a long time, the field has been thinking of, well, what can we do to create difficult stimuli? Well, you work in the olfactory system, so what, what are you doing? You give maybe one smell, let's call that a pineapple smell, or a banana smell, actually more like amylacetate, smells like banana, or you have a different one at the root rate, I think that smells a bit like pineapple, so banana versus pineapple, clearly the activity pattern, so this is a measure of the activity pattern on the surface of the brain, looks very different. So that's not very difficult for an animal to distinguish, you can imagine. But now let's look at those, those mixtures, you know, 60% of one, 40% of the other, or 40% of one, or 60% of the other. These pictures look almost identical, seem to be not really, not really easily distinguishable with the kind of instruments we have. So you would argue that that might be the kind of stimuli that you want to give to the system to challenge it, make it much simpler, ask it to the equivalent of, I don't know, a 1954 Bordeaux wine from a 1955 wine or something like that. So very similar plan. Or for those of you who want to copy like two different, slightly different roasts that someone uh, in the coffee shop next door I just was, uh, will serve you. Um, however, it turns out that if you give these kind of very seemingly very similar mixtures, uh, either in a simulation or in a lesion experiment or in an electrophysiological experiment, the details don't matter too much, um, actually these are still very trivial things for us. So just distinguishing between two, two, different, two different mixtures is nothing that's particularly hard. You can do it 
computation without any real uh, real uh, <coughs> activity of local neurons, you can lesion the majority of the, of the olfactory rod, just physically suck it away, and animals can still easily perform these kind of discrimination tasks. And in fact, here, where we electrically record from one neuron, black is one way, green is recording, while we get rid of all those, those locally computing neurons, you see there's essentially no difference in the type of, in the type of responses. So that's kind of frustrating and encouraging at the same time. Frustrating because these are clearly not the kind of stimuli with which we can study the brain. Um, encouraging because that forces us to think better. What are the kind of challenges the system really needs to, needs to address? And actually, if you step back a little bit and think of an odors, odors that are roughing through the, through the air here, these, these odors are not just presented neatly as one precise square-like pulse, but actually this is, this is how odors spread in nature. They're sort of turbulent-like like, uh, air movements that create these very highly complex spatial temporal plumes. You see a proxy of that if, you know, in winter you see essentially uh, smoke coming out of chimneys. It doesn't just go straight up and that's it. It has these rich spatial temporal structures. And in fact, if you, if you do these, this is a simulation, a complicated computational fluid dynamic simulation, if you do, do that on my balcony actually here, and you put a very sensitive measurement device, a photonization detector, downwind from an odor source, you do see these very rich temporally structured patterns. And they contain power in very high frequencies, in the tens to hundreds, uh, tens to hundreds of hertz. So there's a lot of information, or at least a lot of structure in very high frequency patterns. And from a variety of, variety of studies, people have postulated that this structure actually contains information about how far an odor is, or whether two odors come from the same source, whether they're behind you to the side, etc. So we reasoned, well, maybe these are the kind of stimuli we should actually pay attention to, not using the equivalent of, I don't know, white, gray, um, gray uh, large area visual stimuli, or just big red triangles and green squares, but actually look at more naturalistic dynamics, because that might be what the system is trying to work with. Um, so we, we, uh, we built devices um, that allows us to actually recreate those stimuli, because they, they have, a lot happens with quite high frequency here, so you need to worry a little bit about engineering, how to, how to develop order delivery devices that allow you to deliver orders with sort of millisecond or at least 10 millisecond precision. We can go into detail for those of you who are interested in these kind of things. Uh, not said that we can make odors that are able to create these short 10 millisecond pulses and you can ask, the, ask an animal or we can ask the system whether you can, uh, can you distinguish between those 10 millisecond pulses separated by 10 or 20 or 25 milliseconds or so. So we have built a tool now that allows us to interrogate the system and ask whether stimuli like these ones, like these complex, uh, rich temporary structured stimuli, are actually detectable and distinguishable to an animal. And to cut a long story short, the key question you have to ask in neuroscience is often from the behavioral end. It doesn't help you that much to know that some information is represented in the brain. You want to know whether the animal has actually access to this kind of information. So to this end, we built some behavioral device where animals could happily live together for up to a year, a year and a half in a big box, 20 mice or so co-house, run around for free food. But essentially for water, they have to work a little bit. They have to crawl up into a separate chamber. They go into that chamber. Now no, a door closes behind them, we give them some privacy or privacy. And now they perform a specific task where they are given us the one order or another order, and they need to need to decide is that an order that I like or don't want them. Like means they're rewarded if they respond to one order, and not like means they're not rewarded if they respond to, to another specific order. And the kind of orders we're giving here are actually these sort of rich temporally structured orders. So we give two orders correlated, co-fluctuating at the same time, or anti-correlated fluctuating in a di different way. So you can look at those orders and say, well, um, if this fluctuation is very fast, but you can't detect those fast timescales, these two, these two types of stimuli would essentially look the same. So averaged across several of those, those cycles, there's the same amount of blue and red order in this case as it is in this case. But if the animal has access to these fine temporal structures, so if it can potentially make use of these rich plumes you saw earlier, they should be able to learn to respond only to one and not respond to the other orders. And Lo and behold, this is what happens, so this is our sort of star-performing animal. It learned to discriminate between those two similar patterns at frequencies when they were oscillating at frequency for 12 hertz, but actually up to almost beyond 50 or 60 hertz. So you imagine an older stimulus fluctuating 50 times a second, whether they're in sync or out of sync, and this animal could relatively reliably, in 9 out of 10 cases correctly, discriminate between those, those two different, uh, different types of stimuli. And as a population of animals, you know, the beauty of these automated 
behavioral systems that a lot of a lot of neuroscience is now looking to understand and dissect more complex psychophysical abilities or general behaviors. So the beauty of this automated system, including the one we developed here, so you can do a large number of trials, which is almost a million trials, 900,000 trials or so, uh, distributed across uh, 40, 40 ish animals. And you see that the performance, whether they can discriminate correctly fluctuations um, at a given frequency, is very high for low frequencies and gradually declines to chance levels, but reaches chance only at frequencies of 60 or so hertz. So what does that mean? That means essentially animals, m mammals, have access to these odor plumes, to potentially information in these, in these rich waffling odor plumes at frequencies up to 50 hertz or uh, 50 hertz or above. Why is that interesting? Why is that useful for animals? Well, I alluded to in the beginning that you know, people think there's information in those odor plumes in these temporal structures that tell you something about space. And one of the, I think, most interesting hypotheses along these lines, it's quite old now, it's almost 30 something, 30 -something years, or, uh, years ago, John Hockfield was trying to understand how animals can in general solve the so-called cocktail party effect. You might know that from the auditory system. From your experience, you go into a, into a busy bar or, and you have lots of people talking at the same time, but you're still somewhat able to concentrate on what one person is saying, although a lot of different sounds bombard you every second. So what you're able to attribute different parts of that sound waves to one specific source and consider the rest background, but you can actually focus your attention on something else and pick out something else from background. So despite all kinds of information hitting you at the same time, from sounds, auditory information, you are actually able to sort to separate those different sources. And that's something in terms of the data processing perspective is very important. You have mixed sources, you need to figure sort of unmix them. <coughs> how that how the brain really does that for the auditory system or for the visual system or others is not so clear. But what Hopkins postulates is that in the olfactory system, uh, where the problem is actually much much harder because you're uh, a given odor, so. I don't know whether I can still smell it. I bought some coffee earlier, and in this, this, the scent of the coffee, there are thousands of different types of volatile chemicals that actually make up this specific one. You probably need dozens and dozens of them to really identify it as a specific coffee. If you want to discriminate them from other ones, you need to really be able to integrate information across many, many different, different chemical compounds. You need to know they all come from the same source. While usually you go into an olfactory, very busy environment, you know, the street, all kinds of smells coming from everywhere, the first thing you need to do is figure out which chemicals come from one source, which chemicals come from another one. And this, you can actually visualize that quite, quite well, that, that the, sort of the, the, the temporal structure of order plumes might help in, again, doing a specific experiment, again, on my balcony, actually, funny enough. Um, so if you put one of these high-speed detectors downwind of the source, about a meter or half a meter or so away from the source. As I showed earlier, you see these temporal fluctuations. Now, if the source is a mixture of two orders, like a sim simple version of the hundreds or so of volatile chemicals coming from the, those coffee beans, then you see, if you have a device that is able to, to, uh, to measure two orders at the same time, you see that actually the other one has pretty much the same kind of temporal structure. Whereas if you separate those two sources just by a few tens of centimeters, you actually will see that they are both both odors show rich temporal structure, but they're largely uncorrelated. And you can do that quite quantitatively, you know, you just vary this, the distance of those two sources, and you see that correlation is very high if it's a mixture and gradually drops over a few tens of centimeters. So conversely, if you know, if you can measure the correlation structure between those two, two types of chemicals here, you know whether they come from different sources or whether they come from the same source. So you can do this cocktail party scene segmentation problem by focusing on the correlations of order chemicals. Knowing now that mice are able to make, able to actually see or able to perceive these uh, high frequency components, we can ask, can they actually detect correlation in these sort of naturalistic odors? And lo and behold, we present animals with these highly correlated and anti-correlated rich temporal structures, and again, they can readily, they can readily learn that uh, up to kind of very good performance of 170 or 80 percent. So in a nutshell, what that what that means to us is that animals can, if they're able, as they're able to take the, to take in the temporal structure of the surrounding, they can actually learn something about space from this temporal structure. For example, if odors come from the same source or from, uh, or from, different, or from different sources, as in this, in this cartoon from a review about, uh, about the world. Um, so for us, for my lab, this now means that we can use these temporally structured, we can use these temporally structured odors as an entry point into understanding how the brain processes complex, more interesting uh, kind of sensory information.
Um, so generally, we, we, we can show that olfaction is not a slow sense, even though you might take time to take in the glass of wine or whatever, whatever you're drinking to figure out what exactly it is. Actually, we're quite quick in, uh, we can make use of much higher temporal frequencies than we would have thought before. Um, and these turbans and plumes that look maybe like a disturbance, like a background noise, like a bug, actually allows or endows the odor plumes with information about, about space. So you can extract information of, uh, about space from time. And more generally, time in the, in the olfactory stimuli, in the smells, provides an additional dimension to the, um, to the general olfactory space. So smelling is not only about you know, the chemicals and how something smells, but actually also the temporal structure. Like vision is not only about colors, but also about shapes. And I think that's, that's why we now have a very, a very promising entry point in understanding representation and computation in the olfactory, in the olfactory system. Um, and by proxy, hopefully have an entry point into understanding that in the brain in general. One thing that we noticed in that specific, in that specific study is we were recording neural activity as well in a mouse from these, from these neurons here that carry information to the rest of the brain. And without going into details exactly how we did that, uh, what we find is with sort of simple machine learning classifiers, if you are recording from you know, a few tens or maybe a hundred of those, of those neurons, you can quite readily tell just from the activity of those neurons, is it a correlated or a non-correlated stimulus. So the information was quite readily accessible. For those of you who deal with classifiers or so, you know, a simple linear classifier, uh, sort of the simplest machine that you could think of, allows you to extract that information from the output, from the output neurons. Now using exactly the same type of classifier on the input, while recording from the input structure, even with hundreds and hundreds of, sort of those records of recording from input structures, you weren't really able to extract much information about the stimuli. Of course that information needs to be there. If, if it's in the output, it needs to have been somewhere in the input, but clearly it was formatted in a way that wasn't particularly, particularly accessible. So if you think back on the question I posed at the very beginning, if you look at the brain region and how information comes in, how information comes out, and what kind of reformatting is happening, we actually now have quite, an, quite a neat model system here. We have information represented poorly in the input and very readily accessible in the output. So we can start asking questions, what type of reformatting does actually happening in these about million, million neurons or so? Um, before excitement becomes overboarding, we don't have an answer yet to what is actually happening. But I want to give you some flavor of how we and others try to understand, try to tackle those sort of mechanistic questions of information processing, information processing in the brain. And in our case, what we want to know is we want to study transformation of representation, we want to study the circuitry, or maybe at a first step, just link those specific output neurons to their corresponding input and understand how information in this green input structure is maybe different to the one in these in these different output units, although they belong to the sort of the same the same kind of model. So how do you how do you deal with trying to link outputs to inputs? Well, this is a beautiful schematic. As often, you know, the annoying bit about biology, biology tends to be a bit more messy sometimes, so it's not as well organized as these nice and neat and straight uh, and straight connections here. So this is the cell body of those cells, and these connections are called, are called dendrites, so the input structure itself. So actually, if you if you um, put a dye into, the, into, the, uh, into this input structure, into this round structure, so called glomeruli, and try to stain all the projection neurons that belong to it. So this is sort of an original image from a microscope, from a focal microscope. If you reconstruct all those projection neurons and where they come from, you see they're spread all over the place. And these, connection, these connections are not particularly straight, they're a bit wobbly. So just by knowing where the location of the input is, you don't know whether this, a neuron in this spot actually belongs to here or belongs to any of the other structures. So effectively, you have to do it the hard way. You have to find those neurons you're interested in, and you have to tra trace their, their uh, neurites, their connection, essentially the wires between different cells, the dendrites, to the particular to the particular input structure. So how do you do these kind of tracing in, in general? Well, if you do want to do it densely, if you don't want to do it anecdotally for one or two cells, but you want to do it for every cell in your sample, the methodology of choice, in many cases, for many decades now, has been electron microscopy for the highest possible resolution. And in the last sort of 20 odd years or so, there has been a little bit of a revolution in electron microscopy. There's not only a specific sections or one anecdotal image, but people have started looking at uh, gain, uh, gathering information from electron microscopy over larger and larger volumes. And a very, very um, sort of pioneering technique shown in this video here is in the scanning electron microscopes, an electron microscope where you show your electrons from the top and you measure their sort of either reflected or backscattered or 
or, uh, or a midget electron is coming back in the same direction. And you can acquire these images as you see here, you know, beam, uh, let's start on the beam count. So you, you acquire an image here from the top, from the top down, an image, and once you've acquired one image, you can actually inside the microscope shave off a tiny bit, collect another image, shave off a tiny bit, collect another image, and tiny bit means sort of a few tens of nanometers. If you do that many, many times, hundreds of thousands of times, you can create volumes of a few tens to hundreds of micrometers and have information in all three dimensions about this entire volume. So this field of volume electron microscopy allows you to look at anatomy at not only at you know, anecdotal sections, but in actual, in actual in that volume. We've done some, some work like that as well. Carlos is the first, first of leading, or the, the senior scientist in the lab, I should say, who's leading this part of my lab. And he's acquired these kind of data sets a long time ago. But if you're, this is a, this data set here, a millimeter by half a millimeter or so, uh, took several months of acquiring this several hundreds of terabytes of raw data. And it's, it's a very, very error-prone, error-prone uh, system. Because you need to make sure that you, that these, all this cutting, which are doesn't, doesn't, you know, doesn't break, your knife doesn't break, you don't, you don't, you don't destroy, um, destroy your sample in the process and so on. So it's not a particularly, particularly scalable, scalable approach, and it's somewhat limited to volumes of sort of sub, uh, 100 microns cubed or, or something like that. But 100 microns cubed is, is sort of not really the structure that our, our volumes of interest are. We're kind of looking at sort of half a cubic millimeter or so. And if you think of an entire mouse brain, that's on the order of half a cubic centimeter. If you think of an entire human brain, I think it's probably some of you know that, I mean, a few hundred cubic centimeters or, or almost, almost a liter, I think. So that's clearly, these kind of electromicroscopy techniques are very challenged by scaling them up to, to these larger mammalian, mammalian sized uh, mammalian -sized structures. So for a couple of years, we've been thinking about what can we do about that? How can we create a method that is both more robust, doesn't require cutting tens of thousands of, uh, of sections, scales potentially to, to entire, uh, entire mammalian brains. And the techniques we've been, we've been uh, using are essentially um, like the computer tomography technique, uh, computer tomography x-ray techniques you might know from hospital settings, except that instead of using a hospital, a hospital x-ray source, we're going to the uh, synchrotrons around, around the world to use the very high intensity synchrotron x-ray radiation to shine it onto our, onto our samples. Who of you knows, knows what a synchrotron actually does? It's worth, it's worth saying two sentences about. <laughs> so a synchrotron, a synchrotron is about you know, a few hundred meters wide <coughs> ring um, where you shoot around electrons uh, at very high speeds. So it's like a collider, like you, know, you see from these particle colliders like CERN or, or others around the world. Except you're not really interested in the electrons at all, but what you're interested in is in using those electrons to create very high energy and very coherent, laser-like, you could say, laser-like X-rays. <coughs> So and that historically has been used for all kinds of things, looking into into um, into I don't know how engines work or how batteries work, or looking into um, looking using uh, for protein crystallography, looking at um, getting getting structure X-ray crystallography that's typically done done at those synchrotrons. So they are they're able to create X-ray sources that are much much higher intensity than what you would find in a, on a bench in a in a hospital or so, where you look into into someone's into someone's body. Uh, and like the difference between you know an old-fashioned tiny, um, tiny uh, incandescent light bulb and a high-powered laser, you can do a lot more in investigating investigating samples using these techniques. The basic principle, and there are a couple around the world, so this is an image I think from the diamond light source near Oxford, when you did it, um, and there are many dotted around, uh, around the world with different, uh, different specifications and different uh, abilities. Um, so the basic technique, if you want to use those x-rays in order to look how look inside the structure. As you all know, X-rays can penetrate tissue, tissue quite well. So you can you make use of this use of this property and shine them onto a sample, shine them through a sample. Look at what get, goes through the sample and use essentially a microscope to look at what comes an optical microscope to look at what comes through the sample. Then you rotate your sample a little bit, do the same thing, rotate it again, and you do that a few hundred rotations, and then do a little bit of not too complicated maths to take those few hundred projections together, and you end up with a volume that. Um, um, a volume representation of what you've been what you've been looking at. So, like you know from you know a hospital CT hospital CT set. Um, and this is now one of those examples from these sort of simple simple type most simple type of um, of uh, X-ray tomography system, simple X-ray tomography systems. Um, but now we're looking into that structure we're interested in your factory bubble. And so you might, if you remembered from a few slides back, you saw these round input structures, the so-called humeroli, 
you saw a layer of output neurons, this is the layer of output neuron, and some meter neurons sitting here, and you might even see these white fibers here, which are, are the dendrites of those projection neurons that stretch somewhere into the, into the glomerula. So these very high-powered uh, synchrotron X-ray tomography systems allow you to look into, into volumes of tissue, in our case brain, but that's relevant for, you know, if you study a lung or pancreas or whatever, or a battery for that matter, you can use the same, you know, use the same, the same kind of technique. Um, so and to give you a slightly, slightly a, a few seconds of how, what kind of features one can detect. So this is what sort of a more hospital-like, but actually benchtop CT system that, that sits in many research departments. What that gives you, this is the input, these round input structures. You kind of see a little bit of it, but no, no substructure. You kind of see that there maybe there is a layer, but not what that layer looks like, and barely see individual cells. If you now go take the same sample, and that's a nice thing, right? You shine X-rays through it. You don't, you're not destroying it. You can take your sample home and go somewhere else. So this is now something we did in our, in our uh, lab in the Francis Crick Institute in, in London, down in the basement. Then we took that system and went to the synchrotron, and you see much higher resolution of exactly the same structures. Beautiful resolving individual neurons, the individual cell bodies, these little round things. Um, and you find even sort of at least you can imagine that there are also these, these dendrites that can be here. And in fact, if we kind of look into the system here from, from the side again, you find this layer of output neurons, these microcells that send information to the rest of the brain, and you see those, those white things here that look like they could be dendrites. The good thing again is X-rays don't destroy your sample. You can take your sample, now you can start destroying it by, by using higher resolution techniques like electron microscopy, serial rock based electron microscopy, like the one I showed you this video of before, can look at exactly the same side and use that sort of as a ground truth to understand how much information can be extract from the signature. And for example, what we see here is we can indeed find those, those, uh, those connecting dendrites that connect the output structure with the input, in many cases quite reliably already from this X-ray tomography, um, tomography image. So these are very standard X-ray tomography techniques that exist in every synchrotron around the world. So it's something very useful if you ever in your future life um, or currently are interested in the structure of something without cutting it open. That's a very good technique that is actually quite, quite available. Um, however, we want to, you know, we always want to push a little bit more. We want to get a bit better, get a bit better resolution so we see even finer structures. And for that, in the next few minutes, I want to introduce you to some more alternative techniques that are a bit more, a bit more advanced X-ray, X-ray, uh, X-ray approaches. And these are done in the European Synchrotron Research Facility that actually, you know, UKRI, the, the British funder of research, has a small stake in, as do many other European countries. Um, so it sits a beautiful Grenoble, this, this ring, you see nicely that's the big ring where electrons are shot around, are shot around and then there's, sometimes you see small buildings sitting on the outside where X-rays go into and people do research. And Alexandra Fakoriano, from this so now group leader, group leader here at the SRF, she is uh, one of the pioneers in using a technique called X-ray nanobolo tomography, long word for something that actually is also relatively complicated, but in a nutshell what you're doing is you take your X-rays that come out of your ring, come out of here, you focus them with two mirrors, very complicated mirrors, but you focus them onto a small spot, and then you put your sample in different positions behind that spot. And you can imagine if you put your sample quite close, that this beam kind of goes through the sample and then becomes very wide. So you get a magnification on that on that detector from what you're seeing here. And you know you can use several distances in order to kind of computationally allow you to create an even higher resolution, higher resolution image. And how do these images look like? Um, maybe let's say if you uh, this is this is how the device looks like. This is Alexandra. So it looks quite, it's a quite complicated, you know, cool to 90 Kelvin, relatively complex, relatively complex device. Um, but as a user, when we go there, we just expect people to make it work, and then we collect nice data. So it's a very good position to be in. And this is the kind of data we can collect with it. So here you see a, about half a cubic millimeter, half a cubic millimeter of tissue. Maybe by now you kind of know what the olfactory valve looks like. So you have these round input structures. You have these, uh, these round circles here are the output neurons, and you see all kinds of structure in between. And these zoomed in pictures give you a sense of how, how good the resolution is. Um, so you really can easily see individual dendrites <coughs> in the smallest ones without, without, too much, uh, without too much trouble. So what are we going to do with this? Well, ultimately what we want to do is we want to understand the function of the brain and how the structure of the brain gives rise to this function. So what are we doing? We are actually looking first at the function of the brain. And, and the way we do this is by making the neurons we're interested in express fluorescent indicators that change their fluorescence depending on whether cells are active or not. In this case, you know, GCAM, GCAM 6 f uh, this specific, specific dye is called. So that you see, you see cells flashing, flashing up when, because we were delivering odors to the animal. We record with a two-photo microscope in the olfactory system, in this early olfactory valve. 
the activity of all these neurons at the same time. But then we can take that same tissue, process it, well, first we said we have to kill the mouse, but then we take the tissue out, stain it, process it, and take it to that particular synchrotron and generate these large volume with very high resolution. And now we, the task is to find the very cells that we performed experiments on before, find them in that volume, and try to understand how are they actually wired up. Um, and this is kind of, uh, I think it doesn't, doesn't show very well, so this is kind of the same region where we did functional imaging here, you see our functional structural image, you see in green you know, all the fibers that were, were being active, in red the blood vasculature, we can go to the same field of view in an X-ray image, uh, where you also see you know, blood vasculature here, and you see some you see some fibers, you can overlay them, and for example, if you zoom in, it's a lot of work, it's like a half a PhD project to make sure to get from, from this over this from this to this and perfectly overlay them, but usually you find it that in the lab did that incredibly well. So now if you find exactly the same region, find the same the same cells in the X-ray image and in the, and in the same blood vessels. So this now allows us to kind of put color to our um, to our physiology because this what we're plotting here is the response of an individual neuron to an order or to different orders. Um, or sorry, the response of different neurons to an order. So here's maybe easier to see this. This top neuron here was responding very vigorously to this one order, the other neuron a bit less, and many didn't respond at all. Whereas here, you know, some neuron responded, some responded even with less activity in the, so the gray is when we present orders. Um, but now we know that all these neurons, they, they belong to some of these glomeruli. We can actually find their anatomy, we can find their circuit, their circuit structure in, uh, in our anatomy, uh, anatomy data set. So we can now sort of color the neurons by which which of these parent glomeruli do they actually belong to? And all of a sudden we see, well, those that are responding strongly here, they all belong to the same glomerulus. They're a bit different from each other, but they're all much more strongly responding than the ones that belong to, to uh, the different structure, and vice versa for this, for this other, other particular one. Um, so we can sort of color in, color in the entire response profile of all the hundreds of neurons as though we record, and know actually where they get, where they get the information from. So if we, if we start off in a pure physiology experiment, we get data sets like this, where we record from, I don't know, 50 or so neurons, or maybe 100 neurons or 50 neurons here, and we give about 50 orders to those neurons, and it's just a mess, right? Given neuron here responds a bit to this order, and not at all to this one, strongly to that one, another one responds. Uh, so it looks like a complete mess. But if you're now sorted by which glomerulus they belong to, all of them you start seeing structure. So all these neurons here belong to the same glomerulus, the same of these input structures, and they respond relatively similarly. Some subtle differences that are particularly exciting, but overall they respond very similarly, and so on and so on. So to give you a sense of how that looks like, so this is now um, all of those all of those glomeruli we've imaged, all of the cells, and we see you're giving one order. Some neurons uh, light up, some red ones, some blue ones light up. At this point, now I think in a few seconds we're going to present a different order, and you see that a uh, different. Oh no, sorry, we just we just made this video last week. So that's not so we see for one order all the blue ones light up and all the, gre uh, the green ones for another order, like the one we get in a second, where the blue ones are not lighting up very much, these red ones are lighting up, these red ones. So you see that actually neurons that share an input channel are indeed quite similar in their overall response profile, but now we can start understanding how they, how they differ in the responses to each other. Um, and this is, this is the entire volume we've looked at, and I think it's 30,000 individual Individual neurons are actually in that in that volume of a few hundred. We have functional activity, and we can now annotate and try to understand how this uh, how this structure underlies their specific their specific function. And we've done this specific experiment that actually is quite a. It used to be quite a lengthy one. You know, you take a mouse, you you image activity of the brain in the lab in London down to King's Cross. You take the tissue out. You look at it in the, in the first synchrotron. You go to a second synchrotron, and then you stitch everything together, process these tens of terabytes and other terabyte data and so on, and then try to align those different data sets and figure out how the function relates to the structure, and then you can, so initially when we did the first time, the entire process took like a year, now we get down to like a few months or so, so we got significantly better, and you saw, you know, we now recorded from more than 400 cells and found most of them in the, in the volume we recorded from the structure. So in this case, this is the, um, this is the entire workflow from from functional imaging in vivo over the structure analysis at different length scales to then link function function and uh, so to now to now know which cells belong to one of those input structures and then we can sort our output. This is now for the sort of larger experiment and know that all these cells belong to the same channel, all these cells belong to the same channel. So essentially, 
what we, are, uh, what we can without, stri without structural information. You get very interesting activity across the brain, across hundreds of, hundreds of cells in response to 50 stimuli or so. But it is very difficult to understand, understand structure, very difficult to understand the matrix, matrix of activity. Whereas if you add structure information to this functional information and sort things by their structural, structural location, you actually start seeing, seeing a logic behind the way cells respond and can then focus your attention on the differences that are meaningful rather than just saying everything looks like, uh, looks like a, complete, a complete mess. So adding structure to function helps you to, uh, helps you to understand and, and give meaning to the activity that you've been recording across the day. So what we can do in this overall workflow is we can functionally image activity, we can go at different length scales and different resolutions down to, the, to, to the, uh, almost a one or a record of several cubic millimeters of high resolution structure analysis and, which I haven't spoken about, we can then take the same sample back home. You know, this, this one mouse has traveled from the fifth floor in the creek to the basement to um, one synchrotron in Switzerland, back to the creek, to another synchrotron in, in France, and now back to the creek, and now it will go into to Imperial to cut out small structures with a femtosecond laser, and then back to the creek for electron microscopy. So it's quite a busy mouse actually over the course of the year. But it's really, that's one of the underappreciated benefits, you know, if you can keep the experiment, if you can keep the the specimen of your experiment and can analyze it again and again, of course you have significantly more, you know, more, more, more resilience, more backup with your experiment. If you have to cut 20,000 sections, and at section 15,000 you make a mistake, you start from the beginning with a new sample, which is not particularly attractive. So here we take the entire sample home, and now we can decide, do we want to destroy it? Do we want to go in and look with the highest resolution we can at specific that region? The question I want to spend the next five minutes or so, so with this, do we actually need to even take that sample and really destroy it? Or can we push the X-ray physicists to even improve what they're doing so that we might, in the end, maybe be able to look at an entire brain with the highest resolution we want without ever having to cut it into, uh, cut it into pieces? Um, so can X-ray really visualize the smallest things we're interested in, the connections between individual neurons or maybe the small fibers, the small, the thinnest axons? And for that, we can again, again go to a different synchrotron in Switzerland in this case, use a technique called tychography. I, I can try to explain how it works later. And with try to, I don't mean that it's in a patronizing way to the extent that I understand the technique. Um, but maybe for now, we just go through the basic facts. This is, um, we take a metal stain and embed a tissue and we cool that to 90 Kelvin, so quite cool. This is a, this is again, the system looks similar to the one. This is a sample, it's in here and a viewer, and then there's eight meters before you actually record the the scattered X-ray, X-rays down there, and that's a machine that's been developed in this specific beam line in for the Paul Institute in uh, Northern Switzerland. Brilliant machine. What we can do is we can actually obtain these high-resolution you know, nervous tissue from tomograms here, um, and the more dose we put on, the more photons we put on, the better the resolution gets. So we increase it to to um, 10 to the 8 gray. Doesn't really matter what that means. It's a lot of radiation. Radiation dose, or increase it even further, and we see a slight improvement in resolution that we can measure. Our resolution goes down from 80 nanometers to 60 to uh, somewhat below below 50 nanometer resolution. This is this example. What does that mean? Well, that means here this is the same tissue, just from the, from the three different three different projections. It's a very nice thing. Unlike cutting sections, where you know the the, the section you cut is always not particularly particularly nice looking. This looks the same from all angles, and you find find all kinds of kind of small structures, structures like um, um, fibers, etc. But this is the 50 nanometer might not be the kind of resolution we want. We want better and better so that, that computer algorithms for segmentation can work, uh, work better and more effectively. We want to push resolution further to 30 or even 20 nanometers. So the simple solution seems to be, you know, put on more photons. The more photons you put in, the more information you get, the better your resolution gets. The problem is, as you might imagine, at some point, Shooting X-rays onto shooting X-rays onto um, onto uh, onto substance. At some point, you start to get radiation damage. You essentially burn something in your tissue. As if you put you know a laser onto a piece of paper for long enough, the laser is strong enough, you might actually burn the piece of paper. And the same thing actually happens when we go to a dose of another factor of five or ten compared to what I showed you earlier, above ten to the nine nine gray. We start seeing this region here, which essentially lost something. Essentially, you can imagine it burned or something evaporated evaporate under a beam, and of course that's not what you want, and that's not when you can analyze your sample in a lot more detail. And it's very consistent. All the samples can survive until five, six times 78 grade. If you put more, if you put more energy on top of it, more photons, you start destroying 
And even we try to go to even lower temperature to a few, few degrees above absolute zero to 15 Kelvin or so, cooling with liquid helium, but even that didn't seem to fully rescue what we were what we were doing. However, and that's where the only chemistry in here comes in for the few chemists here, sorry. Um, my um, colleague um, Arun Banan in, in Bajar, he, he thought, or we thought together, let's look at, let's figure out, you know, does anyone else have used anything to embed something that is more radiation resistant? So what you do when you prepare tissues, for everyone who, of you will ever will have to, will have to do with, work with biological tissue, you usually take it, you process it, you cut it, and you might put it in some plastic so that you can cut it nicely, you can look at it under a microscope. And there are typical plastics people have developed over the last 50 years or so, that are particularly good for electron microscopy, for cutting thin sections, etc. Um, but these are the plastics where I just showed you that they burn at some point. Um, so what about other, other applications? Well, if you think about some other engineering applications where people use plastic or glue, of course, you know, if you send something up to the International Space Station, you don't want a few X-rays or gamma uh, photons to actually cause trouble. So people in the aerospace, or in particular in the space industry, have thought about how to make glues, how to make embedding materials, that are particularly radiation resistant. Similarly, people actually building nuclear reactors it would be disadvantageous if your nuclear reactor was particularly radiation sensitive, would crumble down at some point. So that's what you don't want, what you don't want. So we found a specific resin that's trifunctionalized, there's three groups with that, that crosslink that was supposed to be particularly radiation, radiation resistant. And lo and behold, if when we embedded our samples, our list here again, you see my favorite structure, you know, the olfactory valve inputs, etc. If we embed this structure either in our standard EPON, EPON sample or in what we call tough or trifunctional TF resin, or just tough resin, um, and then put it into the brightest light source in the world, the European synchrotron, that's the brightest X ray source in the world, just put it into sort of an open beam, and you see what happens over the next, uh, next tens of minutes. Um, uh, this is the EPON, the standard EPON system. You start crumbling, evaporating, essentially blowing to pieces after a few, a few hours under this specific beam. And this is actually also a video, but this is the video of the sort of tough resin, trifunctionalized resin embedded, embedded tissue. So that seems to be substantially more, substantially more radiation resistant. Apparently, we've, we so far haven't been able to actually properly destroy it, no matter how much we radiate it. So there's a direct comparison from a different angle, you know, EPON, EPON embedded versus trifunctional. And I think what this shows a little bit is that um, I think at least the way we're doing we're doing neuroscience, circuit neuroscience. You know, there's a lot of engineering when we're building those or delivery devices, working with physicists to build different types of beam lines, or working with chemists to try to understand what the right way is to actually embed and process your samples. Um, and in this case, we we found an embedding resin that seems to be substantially better in dealing with uh, additional radiation. And if we now use that, we can indeed push. We push the resolution down to 30 something, 30 something nanometer at the, uh, the dosage of 10 to the 9. So, uh, also work. What does that mean? Well, you know, for those of you who don't look at uh, EM or X rays very much, this is this. You might not appreciate how beautiful this looks. I, I'm very fascinated. I think it really looks, looks very beautiful. You see, um, you see individual small structures like even you know here contacts between whereas here contacts between cells. You see individual vesicles. So the resolution we got is. Is quite uh, quite profoundly better than what we had what we had seen before. It's so good that you know when we look at a, uh, a small section, we take again the same sample and cut it into pieces with high resolution electron microscopy. You indeed see that these individual dots here are these vesicles that we see in this high resolution image. And actually, you see that also the resin allowed us to embed in a way that that still looks beautiful on the electron microscopy. And we can make use of this, the fact that we first can do X-ray tomography and then we do electron microscopy of the same sample by then directly comparing how does it look in X-rays, how does it look in electron microscopy. This is for a medium rather medium dose of irradiation, what our old embedding materials allow us to do. And this is for the high resolution, uh, for the high dosage, what this new embedding material allows us to do. And you nicely see that you can identify those contacts between cells, those synapses in here that you, that you can verify by these high resolution images. So again, you know, the idea is you get some ground truth with the technique that's well established in order to validate validate the approaches you've been, um, you've been trying to establish. And, you know, lo and behold, we can see about 78% or so of synapses, 70, 75% of the synapses that you would see in our electron microscopy images. Um, maybe that's. So to summarize what I, what I talk, told you about, about X-rays, and I think I probably should also summarize very soon overall, um, X-ray tomography is, uh, is a, in biology, I think, a, um, or in the life sciences in general, a very underestimated tool. 
it's a, actually it's quite democratic. You know, you can just uh, uh, write two pages to Synchrotron and say, I need some time with you in order to do this exciting science. And then they will even pay for your travel, pay for your housing, pay for your experiment. But if you have to, otherwise they cost effectively 20,000 pounds per day. Um, but actually this is all kind of sort of financed by the different research councils, by different, different countries or different consortia. Um, so it's a destructive, it's a non-destructive technique, so you don't have to physically touch your sample pieces. And I think it's very useful just to kind of also bridge different modalities from larger scale um, uh, uh, functional imaging to maybe smaller uh, microscopy. So, and ultimately, you know, these nanotomography experiments where we've actually done biology with gives us 100 nanometer resolution. We can see the fibers that connect cells to other cells. We can see cell morphologies, and we can disambiguate and actually put meaning to this complex activity we otherwise otherwise see that looks otherwise quite quite random. But I think there's hope that we can push X-ray tomography to a point where um, coherent X-ray imaging can actually resolve the very fine structures we're interested in. And I think with the new types of synchrotrons, so the, they, they have sort of go through a wave of becoming about 10,000 times better than they used to be a couple of years ago with massive uh, upgrade upgrade efforts. And DSRF, this uh, synchrotron in the south of France, is the, is the one that um, has done that already. It's worldwide the leading one that, uh, that we have the fortune so I think it's a very X-ray connectomics, so using X-rays to understand the wiring diagram of entire brains is, I think, a very viable, viable proposition. And let me spend two minutes on saying what that potentially means. Um, here in, in Cambridge and LMB, or, um, around the corner, it's one of the pioneering institutions that actually looks at wiring diagrams. It really looks at wire, wiring diagrams. You might be aware of LMB also as a structural biology institute, you know, photocrystallography, cryoelectric microscopy being being pioneered here, but also um, looking at the kind of wiring diagram of, uh, of brains that is one of the best and the best institution, institution in the world. In particular, colleagues of mine here look at, have looked at wiring diagram of, of flies, that the entire fly larvae came from, came fly larvae um, wiring diagram of the brain came from here. And this is amazing, this is now a lookup table, um, look table where people can say, well, this is the neuron I recorded from, what would it be connected to? And look into this that's been generated here and in and um, Geneva Farms Research Campus in near Washington, D.C. Um, the problem is, you know, the challenge is that uh, uh, fly larvae are like 0.001 cubic millimeters, and adult flies 0.08 cubic millimeters. And the pioneering, I should say, is the elegance, the nematode wiring diagram that was manually acquired maybe 40 years ago, so it's even another order of magnitude smaller. So this is tiny compared to the cubic centimeter, that a uh, thousand cubic millimeters that a, a mouse brain is. So it's very difficult to think about the same approaches, the same electromicroscopy approaches to scale up. When people do that for mammals, for mammalian brains, cubic millimeters, even massive consortia um, have need to cut, oops, need to cut. Slack wants to add a help. So needs to cut, um, needs to cut tens of thousands of sections. And even these massive consortia actually made a mistake. So the system, they, the, the first data that they published had to come in two parts because something broke in the middle. And this is 15 million pounds. So it's very difficult, as I said, to make to do this uh, serious action of microscopy. People get better and better, but it's very difficult to imagine how that could scale to an entire mouse brain, let alone an entire human brain. But you know, X-rays actually um, can go through very large volumes. So this is a video from my colleagues at UCL, Claire Walsh and, and Peter Lee, um, and you know, they use uh, X-ray tomography at ESRF to look into entire entire human brains. So this entire human brain, you see in a second how, at what resolution they can actually look at it. But the main thing here is X-rays go through the entire brain and give you information about what is happening in the very, in the very center. And it's a very lengthy movie. I couldn't figure out how to make it go fast. Huh? fast. So if you see, you can zoom. You can, with this, with this X-ray technique, the resolution they got is you can see this tiny folds of the cerebellum. And even, you can't really see individual neurons. It's not good enough for that. But it is good enough to, um, but this is what it shows is that X-rays can go through the entire brain and still resolve information that's almost at the cellular level. So with the X-ray techniques I introduced to you earlier, we just need to scale them up now to, the, to, um, for, to allow us to get the same type of resolution in these, in these substantially larger brains. But actually this brain that is imaged here still sits in the fridge at, uh, so, um, there are a lot of, lot of issues how to translate that to human brains, of course, but you can imagine that it works, that it should work quite well uh, on the scale of mouse. 
So I think uh, X-ray connectomics has a significant trend. As I showed you, there, there, is the, there is the potential for resolution for even the finest structures. So, um, so fundamentally bringing together these large volumes with the techniques for these finer structures and you know, dedicated, dedicated facilities at synchrotron has the perspective to allow you to get to wiring diagrams of entire brains, entire mammalian brains, over the next maybe five years, five years or so. And actually some theoreticians or theoretical uh, X-ray physicists and one of the leading ones, Chris Jacobson, calculated that with the photons that these synchrotrons now allow you to take at one of these streamlines, it should only take, under best circumstances, around six days to get the entire wiring diagram of a mouse brain. That is, you know, everything going very well and a lot of, a lot of practical engineering problems to be solved, but the physics, uh, the physics is there to make that an, a, realistic, a realistic perspective. Um, and with that, maybe I give you just one, one outlook about the third part that I have a couple of slides, but I think it might get too late, too late for it. Um, we want to look at structure, but we also want to look at function, and this gives you a bit of a, a bit of a flavor of what, how the kind of stuff we do in the lab might be of some real-world impact. So we want to, when we, when we want to record, we build, develop some techniques to record from many neurons, from many neurons at the same time. It doesn't really matter too much of how these techniques are, but I want to highlight a little bit how we think about them in a, in a clinical clinical setting. And one is that my former PhD student, Matt Angle, five, seven years, eight years ago, now nine years ago. Uh, used the basic idea behind this technique and then said, well, let's, let's actually develop a human brain computer interface. Um, so he's been building this company that has been, have had some success on a on startup level and hopefully puts the device that he developed based on what he started in, in, in my lab now into patients in the next, in the next year. So doing things in a hopefully um, um, yeah, really sort of disease-focused uh, disease way um, to record from thousands, from thousands or tens of thousands of neurons in, in paralyzed patients or in patients that have no control of external, um, like more late stage motor neuron disease. Or disease. So that's an example where the technology you've developed in the lab might end up being of actual sort of real world importance. But we also started in the last three or four years now to work much more closely with the neurosurgeons actually in, in London. It's all a kind of easy walking distance from the Crick where we're in King's Cross, the Queen Square neurosurgery. And now I have in my lab one neurosurgeon that spends half his time operating and half his time in the post in the lab. And he has the idea to use electrical, ele electrophysiological tools that we are using in the lab normally, like you know, sort of surface electrodes or even those silicon probe electrodes that we use to record neural activity and use them in patient, in operative settings to try to understand where what we are learning about, about how to use those tools in mice, how that can be useful for helping diagnose or helping get an idea of what's going on in a patient brain. I can elaborate in the Q&A a little bit. But it's, as often, I think, we want to then do these type of recordings and bring that together with the structural measurements. Because in many, time, in many cases in the clinic, you know, the neurologists or the surgeons say, well, you need to cut out this piece of brain that doesn't, either doesn't work or you need to cut it out because we want to understand what's wrong with the patient. Sounds a bit gruesome from a neuroscience perspective, but happens very well. People don't know what, what the neurological disease is, and the, the last resort is cutting out a tiny bit of a tiny bit of brain in a living in a living patient. So we think it would be much better to actually record from these regions and maybe really learn what's wrong and we don't destroy very much. But in the first stages we might be able to first record and then take that tissue and try to understand whether the recording tells us something about the underlying structure or vice versa. So hopefully this over the next five to ten years, how these strands in my lab actually actually come together. Um, Interestingly, I think one of the main challenges is that, of course, neurosurgeons, neurologists, engineers, neuroscientists, computer scientists, they tend to not meet very much in a normal setting, and they speak very different languages. So what I, as a neuroscientist, I consider, oh my God, these 50 micrometer wire will cause a lot of, da a lot of damage. A neurosurgeon cuts out a few cubic millimeters <laughs> without any hesitation, because they have a very good understanding what really has an impact on the patient or not. So that's one trivial example of how just talking to each other and understanding what one person's challenge is actually not a problem, not a problem for the other person often. But similarly, when you talk to the X-ray physicists, they always say, well, you know, we need to work with the sample you have. The sample. We say, well, we can modify it, we can embed it, we can stain it and so on. So uh, I feel like half of my, my work over the last five years or so has been like translating between different, different kind of disciplines. But honestly, that's quite fun that you speak to the doctor, physicists, and engineer, chemists, computer scientists, and try to bring all this knowledge together. And that's true for all these different different strands in uh, in my lab. So generally, what did I talk about? Talk to you about? I talked to you about what's our entry point into understanding the brain. 
smells is our entry point, we bombard the system with smells, we now have, I think, a good understanding what the kind of stimuli should be in order to learn something about the brain, these temporary structured ones, the time is our new dimension for affection. I talked at length about our efforts to get to the structural underpinning of function, in particular using, using uh, X-ray technology, and in the last slide, gave you some thought about how we think about translating these electrical recording techniques we're developing and using in the lab onto onto patient settings. And we I always try to have the pictures of the people that did uh, did all the did all the work, the PhDs and postdocs, staff scientists and collaborators. Um, this is here, this is here my my lab at the moment from all over the place. This is truly all the passports these people these people these people have. An amazing group of people I'm very very fortunate to work with. And some of my recent alumni, particularly proud of them starting or being professors at Boyce or Rupi at the St. Peter Work Hub or at the uh, professor at IIT uh, or University of Holland. So that have been majorly contributed. I should highlight as well not only my lab, but in particular our X-ray collaborators that are all listed here. I put them on some of the on some of the slides here. It's it's a great been a great collaboration working with these brilliant people at European Synchrotron as well as the Paul Shower Institute in particular, as well as actually at Stan Leitz as well. They didn't show that much that much data today. Um, and with that, thank you very much for your attention. for the really excellent and informative talk. Andreas is perfectly fine, otherwise I'd be even older than I am. <laughs> yeah, no, um, well, I'll just open the floor up to, uh, for some questions. Uh, anybody has some questions to talk to? Um, at the back first. Do you think uh, X-ray photography can for you less zero EMP? So I, I, I think uh, for the next couple of years, uh, serial section electromicroscopy or different variants of that, you know, cutting thicker section and then doing a mixture of cutting outside and inside a machine, I think will be the technique that gives the wiry diagrams for sort of cubic millimeter. But it's a lot of effort. It will be nothing you can do routinely after, after a physiology experiment. I think what I find attractive is if you have done functional, uh, if you collect functional data and an animal doing some complicated task, that you can be quite certain that you can now look at the wiring diagram of the same of the same structure, and that reliability and throughput is very difficult to get for zero section approaches. Just cutting tens of thousands of sections with a near hundred percent reliability is tough. Fundamentally, scaling that up to the entire mouse brain. I mean, there are there's a massive NIH program, Wellcome has sort of released big connectomics um, connectomics uh, sort of uh, roadmaps. Uh, it's I think it's. Probably it's a bit like you know the Sanger sequencing for the human genome. The first sequencing effort was with very traditional, very expensive, not very scalable techniques, but actually got that basic first human genome. And so it's quite possible that with massive considered effort, with many samples breaking down and coming to that one where you get a full electromicroscopy volume of an entire mouse brain. That's very possible that electromicroscopy will achieve that over the next 10 years. I think with X-rays. The physics uh, is there, that you can get the resolution you need. Um, the engineering to build them is also there. You know, so there is a lot of opportunity to use machine learning algorithms to make it much quicker and much better, because you can take the same sample and look at it afterwards with a different modality, so you can learn how it should look like, and even improve your algorithms. So even without taking that into account, in principle everything's there. The challenge is that these are democratic instruments, because, you know, big synchrotron, you can apply to go there, that's great, but it also means that the decision to dedicate, like, this beam line, that, not, not, not that not everyone could have access, but it's dedicated to spend the next three months in doing a mouse brain, that is actually quite difficult, and make them build one beam line exactly specified for large volume nanobioimaging. The good news is we were um, successful to convince ESRF to commit a beam line to do that, so now they will develop, or we will develop a beam line for nanobioimaging, for both large volume, for mouse brain, as well as for high throughput, smaller, um, uh, smaller cells, but, lot, but really high, really high throughput for smaller pieces of tissue. So I think it's, how long will it take until that beam line is operational? Probably three years, or so. And I think in three years, we might have a chance that we could start actually looking at larger volume, several cubic millimeters possibly, and I think in the long run, it will be like sequencing today, right? You have a lot of different sequencing techniques um, that all sort of fulfill a specific angle. They all use reference genomes to optimize what they're doing. Um, so I think it will be sort of an ecosystem. Initially, X-rays will maybe provide also 
low, non-damaging lower resolution overview, 100 nanometer overview of large volume, so you can figure out which is the best sample to put all the effort in for electron microscopy. But more and more, I think the information coming out of X-ray tomography will be sufficient to answer these uh, connectomic questions. But you get a very biased view from me. <laughs> is there an unknown limitation, like upper limit on the X-ray methods, similar to how optical microscopes have like upper limit what we can use due to diffraction? Or is it all just so far engineering problems that can be sort of circumvented? Um, so, so we are in the fortunate situation that um, you know people have been developing these X-ray techniques often on um, on I don't know some hard subst sub hard substrates. So, for example, um, I don't know copper on silicon, like computer chips. Um, one reason of doing that, actually, I, I always thought it was a gimmick, but actually. Um, if you think about modern modern day computer chips, they are very three dimensional now. You have many many layers, and the feature size is sort of nanometers, right? A few nanometers, um, and there needs to be a lot of error um, uh, assessment or quality control. Um, and funnily enough, the techniques that we in the connectomics field now use in the electromicroscopy, so with multi beam scanning electromicroscopy, so not scanning with one beam, but scanning with hundreds at the same time, so much, much higher throughput. These were originally developed by Zeiss, the, the microscope manufacturer, for the chip industry. Then there was a time when the chip industry didn't need them, so they were all, the handful of instruments all went to connectomics. Now the chip industry is very interested in them again. And I think these tychography techniques, the big papers, there's several nature papers coming out of this group at CSAC here, these, these were all on chips. And in chips, they realized resolutions of sub five nanometers um, isotropic. So, the fact that, so the, the practical limitations at this point for a very hard substance is five nanometer or below five nanometer. Where does this limitation come from? It's still only things like mechanical vibrations, beam instabilities that you can either engineering wise deal with or computationally. So there are ways to be potentially improve that further. The fundamental limitations for different techniques are different. For nanotomography, I think the limitation here has to do something with you know the wavelength of the of the X-ray, which is in the sub nanometer. For tychography, I'm not so sure what the fundamental limitations actually are, because what you are dealing with is you, you shoot your X-rays, focus them on your sample, and then you look at scattering, truly scattering. It's like protein crystallography. So what what you what the limit the, uh, the limit is how far out can you detect scattering? The further out you detect it, the smaller your your spatial frequency. So I think the limitation is actually the radiation damage to the sample. So like it is for um, for X-ray. Um, uh, for protein X-ray crystallography or cryo-electromicroscopy. There you solve it by just averaging across many structures. So from a practical neuroscience perspective, physics is not the good news. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned about the, the, sorry, the complete firing diagram of the device. Um, what do you think are like, if you scale it up like a human brain, like what do you think are the potential Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very good question. I mean, the, there are several several directions. One is um, purely discovery research. You want to understand, you know, you record in the brain region why an animal or why a human is doing something. You want to understand why. What is it? What is the wh why of cells responding to it? And the why is sort of the mechanistic mechanistic underpinning. That's a sort of pure pure um, discovery research question. Now, um, the more applied questions, I think, go in two directions. One is that essentially all neurological and psychiatric diseases, they might have molecular reasons, like some misfolded protein, some receptor broken, etc. But the more complicated ones, that are more difficult to attribute to a specific gene being wrong, like neurodevelopmental disorders or anything, autism spectrum disorder, like, uh, like diseases, are probably some miswiring. That's what everyone says, what everyone thinks, but we simply don't have any data to it. If it's very simple miswiring, that these interneurons never get input, fine. But those are, those are not the type of the type of diseases that are really, really challenging psychiatrically. Schizophrenia, any, any, any other psychiatric disease. In the end, it's some miswiring. So far, we don't have any technique to actually assess what is going wrong. So we also don't have any technique of how treating that potentially might, um, might, might what kind of treatment might be needed to compensate for that mis miswiring. Um, so I think fundamentally being able to actually, at scale, say in a, in a patient, this is the wiring diagram of that, that's what's wrong, 
would be a massive uh, would be a massive uh, massive benefit for mechanistically understanding those type of diseases. The other the other application which I think we, we are fortunate in the Crick that uh, Demis Asabis is on our on our um, scientific advisory board and at the Crick Kuiper, so the founder of Google DeepMind, so one of the sort of I think most prominent, the most impactful a uh, machine learning AI companies. Um, and when you talk to him or his co-founder Shane Lag, they tend to um, historically have used a lot of neuroscience as not only inspiration but actually as sort of main ingredients into their machine learning algorithms of the field test, right? From the initial idea that you integrate information to learning synaptic weights to you know deep reinforcement learning, multi-layer networks, all this is in the end inspiration from uh, from different aspects of neuroscience. I think today <coughs> they seem to think that the majority of impact from neuroscience comes from understanding how different modules of the brain interact or so, less so from the individual circuitry, individual wiring diagram. Um, now, you know, if you're a circuit neuroscientist, you like to think that the reason that machine learning um, models hallucinate or have all kinds of other, or all kinds of other issues, that they're adversarial AI, that they make mistakes that humans never would make, that this might be something because the fundamentally the starting point of the wiring diagram of the neural networks has nothing to do with the wiring diagrams of actual mammals. And one of the best arguments in the end, you know, if, if you look at learning from a, a newborn, they learn something, they don't learn from zero, they learn based on sort of several billion years of evolution that has sort of set up some basic wiring that is definitely not random. So my certainly neuroscience, circuit neuroscience enthusiasm would say if we understand what is the what are the basic wiring diagrams, how maybe the wiring diagram of the human cortical column is different from a mouse one, how different how different brain regions differ, we can use the statistics or the specific properties of those wiring diagrams to maybe also make machine learning models more robust. But the disclaimer is that the machine learning people don't think that. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's see. Do I always tell me, well, if you think so, be quick. Because we get better soon. <laughs> All right, I think in the interest of time, we'll just um, cut it there. So, um, I mean, if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to stick around a bit longer. So, uh, we thank you for coming to uh, SciSoft's uh, first talk of the term. And quick, please put our hands together again. So, thanks. Thank you.